Hello, everyone. Looks like we are live. So I'll have about five more minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to say hello in the comments, you can say hello and let us know maybe where you're tuning in from or if you have any questions. We're talking um, about photographs and old photograph preservation today. So um, feel free to chat it, chat it up in the comments and we'll get started in about five minutes. Hope y'all are having a good day. Uh, here in Eureka, it's gotten to be nice and sunny, uh, which is very nice. So if you're just tuning in, we're going to be talking old photograph preservation today, um, how we do it here at the museum, how some other places do their photograph preservation, uh, why that's important, and how you can do photograph preservation at home. Um, so if you have any questions going into it, feel free to put them in the comments. You can also comment along the way, and I'll try to catch them as they come in. Um, and yeah, we're going to get started right at 2. So feel free to hit that little share button um, and you can invite your friends to tune in as well. Um, there's also a little invite bar that you should see right under the um, description of this talk. So you can always invite people that way. And as with many of our videos, uh, we have a little fundraiser button right there. This is uh, a little bit of a different one. Um, so it is our uh, 60th birthday month this month. Um, and we have this kind of fundraiser going for the entire length of the month. So we're trying to raise $10,000. We're at about 6,000 right now. So if um, you wanna help us crush that $10,000 goal, uh, feel free to drop a couple bucks in the donation box here. Um, you can also send us a check or donate through our website. There's many different ways. Uh, we appreciate your support in helping to bring local history um, to everyone. So we got about one more minute and we'll go ahead and get started. Got some exciting things on the on the radar for today. Um, Old photographs are a lot of fun. Um, 
hear weird squeaking. That's my chair. It's a very talkative chair. Where'd it go? There it is. Okay. Photographs. All right, so the clock struck two. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So hello everyone, my name is Katie and I'm the interim director curator here at the Clark Museum in Old Town. Um, and today we're gonna to be talking about old photograph preservation, why it's important, how to do it yourself at home and how different museums um, do photograph preservation. So I'm here today in the museum in our little office with some access to some great photos. Um, so I guess the first important question is why, why does old photograph um, preservation, why is it important? Um, it's not only is it a really fun visual adventure. Um, I know I love looking at what people were wearing, what people are doing, different things like that while looking at old photos. Um, but it gives us kind of a little, little literal snapshot into the past. Um, it can tell you a lot about kind of what was important for people at the time. You know, early on for photographs, it was very expensive to take photographs, to bring a photographer somewhere. Cameras were hard to transport. They could be these huge boxes that needed just the perfect conditions to take photos. It wasn't easy and it was um, very expensive to take photos. So early photos, you might notice, particularly in um, scenes kind of like, oh, this is kind of a later one, but kind of in earlier scenes, you might notice that the people pictured are wearing really nice clothes, but they might just be standing outside of a storefront, um, which you might not really recognize that it's kind of strange, but, um, and people look very posed. Um, photographs like that were taken at a time when someone might've heard that a traveling photographer was coming through. Traveling photography was a thing. Um, turn of the century, people were selling photographic prints for postcards um, and for all kinds of other things just to get a glimpse into these different places. Um, so when a photographer was coming to town, and if you heard about it, you wanted to dress up nice and go stand wherever that photographer is going to be taking pictures so you can get a picture of yourself. Because a lot of people didn't have pictures of themselves, particularly if you didn't have a lot of money, you couldn't afford a photographer, you couldn't go to a photographic studio, maybe there might not be one near you. Um, so you wanted to show up when the photographer showed up so you could get a picture. Um, so it gives you kind of a glimpse into that, you know, wealthier people might have had photos of babies and of toddlers and of children and of adults. Um, it can tell you, it can show you different locations and how they changed over time. That's what a lot of people will use our collection for, um, is for looking at like my house used to be here, but then why in this picture is it shown on E Street where we live on J Street now? Um, kind of that kind of thing. Um, looking at how landscapes have changed. You see that a lot in logging photography. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see when those changes happened. Um, also shows families. One thing that comes to mind very quickly when I think of families in photography was there's this Victorian trend of post-mortem photography, um, which is kind of interesting. So we don't have any that I know of at the Clark, but there are these pictures that when, if a child died very young, um, the family might pay to have a photo taken of the child and they would pose, the, pose them kind of in a, in a lifelike way. But this, when you look at the pictures, you can tell something is not quite right. Um, and that was as a way to remember their child. Um, and then you can also see different employment, kind of what jobs people were doing, the ages of people doing those jobs. I found some photos recently of what looked like kids to be working in a mill, um, which was an interesting find. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to find that. I was looking for something pretty different. Um, and so you can kind of see how that's changed over time. You can see how work conditions changed over time. Um, so photography, pho historic photographs are very important to preserve for all kinds of different ways. And then there's plenty of other ways that I didn't write down. Um, so if you're wondering how we store photos at the museum, we have these boxes. 
And so this is just the lid because the box is actually sitting here. So we have these boxes um, that are made of this special board. Sometimes it's called blue board, but this is gray. So I, th I think it might be called gray board. Imagine that. Um, and so these are specially manufactured by um, companies that serve archives. So things like museums, things like, you know, the historical society. Um, and they come in all different sizes. So if you've attended previous programs at the museum, particularly we had one about um, storing historic quilts, you might recognize these. They come in all kinds of sizes for all different kinds of things. Um, and they're very helpful. And they're reinforced with these special edges so they don't break as easily. Um, they're meant to last. And they're made with uh, as acid-free and lignin-free. I think that's how that's pronounced. Um, but those are two things I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, besides that, we also store the photos in these sleeves. So I'm going to put my gloves on real quick. And I'll talk a little bit about this um, in the second part of our little program today. So we store our photos in these plastic sleeves. So these are polypropylene, if I'm remembering right. Um, so they're generally a little bit bigger than the photograph. Let me hold it back a little bit so you can see it. Um, so there's some room for the photograph to kind of move around. It's not really, it's not really wedged in there. Let me get move the microphone over here. Um, and they have kind of these overhangs right here, you can kind of see. So um, you could, you know, pull this to kind of pull it out of something if it was in something. Um, and so these help protect the photos from being bumped around. Um, they protect them from being scratched as well. Um, and they're see-through so we can actually see what the photo is. We don't necessarily have to take it out of the sleeve unless we need to do something with it. This is kind of a fun photo, some, some guys in the stable. Um, looks like they're doing horseshoes. Uh, anyway, so polypropylene sleeves and they come in all kinds of different sizes. Like here's a small one, here's a teeny one. There we go, gotta be sure you guys can actually see them. Is that a goat? Maybe a dog. I think it's a dog, looks like a goat. Anyway, these are fun to look through. Um, so one thing we're doing here at the museum is a scanning project. And so a couple things. Um, scanning is very important because if, so the main reason it's important is because um, it helps us make the file, makes the photos available digitally. So if for instance, a, um, a researcher contacts us and says, you know, maybe I'm in New York and I'm trying to find pictures of the, and I hear you guys have them. We can look them up and then we can email them to them without having to go find the pictures, scan them, and then send them. Or find the pictures, photocopy them, and mail them. We don't have to do that anymore. So it adds a little bit of speed to the process. And this isn't because we're, you know, we're not lazy or anything like that. It has to do with protecting the photographs. So these photos can be pretty old. These, the two I held up aren't too bad, but say for instance, this one, which isn't the worst like situation I've seen, but you can see it's got some wear around the edges, you know, but some of these photos are in not very good shape. And oftentimes they came to us that way. Um, someone might've said, I was cleaning out a house and I found this thing stuck in a wall, which has happened. Um, and you know, it's kind of just barely hanging in there and you're really hoping it doesn't break. Um, and it would not be good for the life, the li lifetime longevity of the photo to have to scan it, scan it, scan it, rescan it, you know, every time someone asks to see it or if we wanted to use it for something. So it's really important that we are able to have these photos scanned. Another very important reason um, is if something were to happen, um, it could be literally anything. And you know, what happens if the originals are lost? Having a scanned version of it, it definitely does not replace having the original, but it's very helpful in that 
we could still have a record of the photograph. It's also helping us to keep track of um, what the photographs look like. So, um, in, you know, for instance, in keeping track of their condition. So let me show you guys something really quick. Um, so I'm gonna show you our, let's see. This is our database. It is um, called Past Perfect. Actually, let me go over here. Um, so this is where we keep track of all of our items. So for instance, this is part of our ongoing photograph project right now. Um, this is a photo from the Stevens family um, of a studio portrait of a boy who's 14 or 15 wearing a white shirt with a loose fitting tie, the Italian look, um, from Sealy Studio 1930s. So here's that photo. So this has been scanned by our registrar, Alex. This is a project that she's working on right now is scanning these photos in so we can get a look at them. You know, if I wanted to reprint this for an exhibit, I could save it, print it, good to go. If we wanted to use it for a postcard or if we wanted to send it to someone who was doing research, maybe on Sealy Studio, we could do that. Um, we can also share these photos online. If you follow our blog or follow our Facebook or our Twitter or our Instagram, um, you've probably seen some of these historic photos and that's thanks to this scanning project. And we've scanned thousands of photos already, um, but there's still thousands more to go. We have a lot of photos. So um, it's a great way for us to get this really visual aspect of our region's history out into the world and accessible to more people rather than being in storage and coming out whenever we do exhibits or if someone knows that we have it and wants it for research. Um, so, and it, like I mentioned a little bit easier, it is easier to access the reproductions than it might be to go and get the, um, the originals. And it, it is safer for the originals for them to not be handled as frequently. So that's kind of what we're doing here. And so that the scanning project I kind of briefly mentioned is that Alex is going through and scanning all of our photographs. So let me stop this really quick. Okay. So Alex is going through and scanning all of our photographs. Um, and so what that entails is she comes into the museum and she picks up a box like this. And she takes these photos home and she scans them all since she's working from home and she scans them all front and back in some cases if there's information on the back of them. And then she saves them under what's called their accession number. So each of these photos has an accession number on it, which you might be able to see right around here. The plastic might be kind of blurring it out, but each, um, that's how we keep track of our items. So she scans it, she changes the, changes the file name to be that accession number. And then um, she goes and up, updates its information in past perfect. So then we know, is the photo where the record says it was? Is the photo scanned? Um, and it just allows us to kind of inventory, see what's there, if something got moved, if something is missing, we can update it in past perfect. So it's kind of a multifaceted inventory as well as digitization project. And with all the stuff that's going on with COVID, it's really nice to be able to have this, these things available online for the public. Um, because lots of people have more research time now. Um, but also it's a good way to keep us continuing working away while we're close to the public, which we miss you guys. And we're really looking forward to the day when everyone can come back and visit. Um, so as for photo preservation elsewhere, um, I'm gonna do a little screen share again. Let me find, where did that go? Okay. 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 So as for photos elsewhere, so uh, this is something that I found out about eh, probably about two years ago. It's called Calisphere. Um, so this is run by the University of California. And this is a place where universities in California are able to share their information online, which is really cool. So you can see a list of the contributing institutions, collections, things like that. So I'm gonna look up um, Bancroft, which is at 
Berkeley. Um, and so the Bancroft, if you haven't heard of it, um, was founded by this guy, Hubert Howe Bancroft, or is named after him. Um, and it houses collections uh, pertaining to California's history. So there's all kinds of stuff in here. Um, and this has, you know, digitized photos. It has where the photos are at, um, you know, ways to download the image if you need it for something, cite it, um, where it's located. There's even audio, audio files like this one is a recollection of Hubert Howe Bancroft. Um, photos, book illustrations, um, all kinds of things. And they have these really cool collections as well. Um, correspondence, things related to um, the Japanese American internment, all kinds of things. So if you're ever doing some sort of research having to do with local history, you could probably find some good stuff on Humboldt County here. Let's look it up really quick. And of course, this is like a multi-million dollar kind of project to be able to get all this stuff digitized and accessible. Um, so like here, this is Camp Grant near Dyerville. So uh, if you're familiar with Humboldt County, uh, Humboldt Redwood State Park in Southern Humboldt, um, there's a turnoff called the Dyerville uh, Lookout or Overlook. Um, and so this was taken somewhere near there. Actually, this is kind of past the Founders Grove area. So anyway, this is one kind of thing. Um, I've used images from Calisphere in our Chinese expulsion exhibit. Um, it's got all kinds of good information and they're adding more stuff to it all the time, which is awesome. So another one, and this is kind of a local, uh, as far as I know, one man show who's kind of running this. Uh, there's a guy named Steve Lazar, who's currently the president of the Humboldt County Historical Society. He's done a presentation here at the Clark about this project. It's called the Humboldt Project. And so he's collecting postcards um, having to do with all things Humboldt County. Um, he's got some pretty stellar images on here. If you ever like have a chance to take a look at this, whoops. That didn't work. Oh, goodness. OK. Um, looks like today is not this website's day. So anyway, he's got all kinds of photographs. Um, so a lot of these are photographs that might have been taken by those traveling photographers I mentioned a little bit earlier. And some of these, like this one probably, um, were colorized. So it was a way where you could take the photo, you'd process it, and in that processing, you would paint colors. And that was a way people did color photography uh, before color photography was a thing. Um, and so you'll see these postcards all over the place. I know they print some and have some at um, Just My Type here in Old Town. And they're really gorgeous images. We do have a lot of these in the collection as well. Um, and then if you're looking for another local photography kind of place, the Humboldt Room uh, in the special collections area of HSU's library, Humboldt State. They have a lot of their photographs digitized. So let me see here. Um, what do I want to look up? I'll look up streetcar. So kind of, they have like a, a main core of photos that are digitized. Palmquist is definitely one of them. Swanland Baker is another. Um, and the photographs here are available. They tell you what kind they have. Um, and then an image of the photo. Sometimes it'll say like if there's people that are named in it, things like that, or if it's just a description. Sometimes they can even include the date depending on how the collection was found and processed. So this is a cool old streetcar scene down here in Old Town, or what's now known as Old Town. Um, so, and that's, it's cool because then you can zoom in on the photos, you can see the details, oh, that guy's wearing a hat, you know, like, um, there's streetcar numbers, this one is number 14. Um, and they have all kinds of photos from these to, um, to aerial photos, older photos, newer photos, portraits, all kinds of things. <clears throat> and I think they are currently closed in person if you wanted to go in there, but you can always give them a call if there is something in particular you want to see. Uh, Carly's their librarian over there. She's real nice. She's on our board also. 
Um, okay, so that's kind of a little bit of photographic preservation from the museum side of things, why it's important, how other places are doing it. Um, let's talk a little bit about museum or photography, preserving photography at home. Um, actually, let me answer some of these questions really quick. So do this really quick. Okay. So do you track people who look through your photos? Do you get calls from the public for these photos often? Um, we don't track who's looking through our photos. Um, so there's that. Um, do you get calls from the public for these photos often? Uh, I wouldn't say often, but it does happen. Um, there was someone, oh man, I can't remember her name now, but I know she was working on the electrical box at Harrison S. There used to be a trolley stop there um, and she was painting um, a picture of a trolley on the street, or not, not the streetcar box, the power box there, electrical box. Um, so she called us up to get some photos of what the streetcars looked like, what some of the streetcar engineer people looked like, what their uniforms looked like, things like that. That was really fun to help with. Um, and it got me researching local streetcars and their history and all that fun stuff. Um, we have sent photos over to Sequoia Park. They were doing kind of a history project there. Um, so it does happen occasionally. Um, we have gotten a number of people asking for photos of their house if they moved into a, a, a historic home locally, trying to find their house um, and old photos. So that's kind of fun sometimes. Um, so yeah, that's kind of an answer for that. Um, and yeah, so we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about photography preservation at home. So um, one thing that kind of happens is that sometimes people come by and they're like, I have these photos and I want to donate them to you. Um, and sometimes the photos are in really good shape. They might be well organized. We might have names on them. The person might be like, I know exactly who the people are in these photos and I know they were taken here and here you go. Um, and then sometimes people might bring in photos that might, you could tell they're very damaged, they're not very stable, they don't really know where they were taken, they don't know the people in them. Um, and they're like, maybe they're from here or I found them somewhere. Um, and that's always kind of a bummer um, because if we don't really have much information on the photos, we might not take them because storage space is very limited. It's really important that we keep that in mind and spend some time trying to figure out if we have a bunch of information on these people um, and these photos. It's really important to kind of honor that we have limited space so we can't take everything. Um, so when it comes to doing photo preservation at home, I, I think it's really important um, that the public kind of take this on as an important project to do at home. And then in the future, they can go into archives or be passed along or whatnot. And they're gonna be a lot more interesting for people to look at if they have more information on what, on what um, the photos are, what they're about. So when you're at, so let's just say you're at home and you're doing some quarantine cleaning and you come across a bunch of photos, just maybe sitting in a shoebox or something somewhere. And so things you want to uh, look at when it comes to preserving photos is look at their condition. So what condition are they in? Um, maybe some of that, uh, some of the problems with the condition might have been how they were stored. Maybe it was just how the photographs were originally produced. There might be some really crazy acids and things in them that just don't last for a long time. Take a look at the condition. Um, do you have info related to the photographs? That is super, super, super important. People are more inclined to keep things that they know the backstories of. I definitely know I am. Um, and it's, it's more helpful for people who might be like, what the, I found this box of photos. What's this about? Um, and so be sure to definitely record that information. If you know who took the photo, where it was at, who's in it, the year, the day, whatever information you have, be sure to record that. Um, 
you also want to take a look at the layout of the photos. So are they just loose photos? Are they in a scrapbook maybe? Um, are they, you know, stacked or what is their, what are they looking like right now? Um, if they're in a scrapbook or glued to something or glued to each other or something like that, something you're going to have to think about is, um, are the acids that are going to be coming off of that glue over time, um, possibly affecting other photographs. So things to, you might want to take that photograph and set it aside from everyone else if it has glue or other kind of sticky things on it. Um, you also want to look at the order that the photos are in. If, you know, that sometimes they might just be tossed in a box and you have no idea what the order is, but maybe there might be tabs, there might be dates on the back, things like that. If there is an order to it, you want to keep them in that order. If there isn't an order, you might want to try to make an order. Um, a lot of times photos are can, well, the photos can be sorted in a couple different ways. Sometimes they're sorted by who took them. At the Clark, we sort them by topic. So these one, this one has um, stables, unidentified buildings and offices, banks, insurance, utilities, Belcher and Crane, and laundry. Um, so maybe think about how you want to organize them. Um, if while you're searching through said photos, you find rubber bands, uh, paper clips, or staples, you want to get those out of there. Um, rubber bands are kind of the bane of museum people's ex uh, experience, existence, sorry, bane of our existence. Um, over time, they just, they kind of degrade and they get all gross. Um, and they can affect photos, they can get stuck to them. It's, it's not a pretty sight. Um, staples and paper clips can rust, um, which affects the photos. It can get on you know, important pieces of information, things like that. So you wanna keep an eye out for that, that. Okay, so you've considered all that, you've looked at your box of photos and you've considered this, you know, you've gotten rid of the paper clips, you've kind of got them in order. Um, you might have your record of information on who's in the photos. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in later. So, okay, so you have your photos, kind of have an idea of what's going on with them. Now you're looking for a place to store them. So location, 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 location is super important. Um, particularly here in Humboldt County, we have mold, we have rain, it's cold. Um, you wanna be sure they're in a place where the temperature is stable, it's not moldy and it's not damp. Um, those three things are going to do a number on your photos if they're not protected. So it's also important to keep your photos in a place where they're accessible and you can get a hold of them in case there's an emergency and you got to run out of the house. Um, if they're also accessible, then you might be more inclined to check up on them. It's good to check on them every once in a while just to be sure that, you know, not, some bug hasn't gotten in there or anything like that. Um, and also just, you know, it's good to take a look at them every once in a while, photos like to be looked at. Um, when you're boxing up said photos to put in a safe location, you wanna put them in something that's safe. Imagine that. Um, so you wanna look for acid and lignin free boxes. There are, you know, you'll go all over the place and there are different companies and things that are like archival boxes. The thing is, is to get the title of archival quality box, you don't really have to do anything. You can just be a box and people can say that. Um, there's not a standard necessarily for that. So um, keep an eye out. If you wanna go like professional, we get our boxes from, um, it's like uh, University Products, I think is the name, um, or Gaylord Archival. They do get a little steep in price, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but occasionally they have sales and things like that. And Gaylord does a really good job of providing extra um, information on how to properly store your items for, with literally like any range of items. If you got clothes, you got books, you got letters, you got all kinds of things, they will lay it out and tell you how to store your stuff, um, which is helpful, pretty cool. Um, 
So, and you also want your photos to be flat to prevent bending. If for some reason they are too big for the box, you might want to get a larger box. You don't really want them to be kind of curled up along the edges. It just adds more stress to the paper that doesn't necessarily need to be there. And so with record keeping, um, I recommend keeping the records as close to the photos as possible. And when I say that, I mean, like you could, you could write in pencil. I would recommend pencil over something like ar archival ink. You can write on the back of the photo and you know, write your information or whatnot. Um, some photos, particularly more modern ones, kind of have that weird glossy back. So you can use like archival ink on the back. Um, if you use regular pens or Sharpies or whatnot, they have a lot of acids in them that can eat through the paper over time. And that's not good because you know, you're looking at the photo and there might be a hole in it from the acid. Um, it really kind of weakens the photo. Um, and try to include as much information as you can and be sure you write clearly. Try not to write in cursive. <laughs> um, it's hard to read, but if you can do nice, clear writing, that's golden. Um, you also kind of want to note on the exterior of the box, particularly if you have a bunch of boxes with photos, you want to note on the outside what's in the box. It's easier than having to take the box down, open it and dig through things, trying to figure out what it is. So like what we did here um, is we printed it out and we taped it on here. Um, I generally don't recommend tape, but since this is on the outside of the box, it's a little safer. You wouldn't wanna put like a label on the inside with tape. That was another thing along with paper clips, rubber bands and staples, avoid tape, don't use it. Um, if it's on the photo and you can't really get it off, um, they're just gonna to have to let it kind of stay like that. Um, but tape over time can really do some damage. Um, let's see, and more info is better than less info when it comes to recording things about photos and people and things like that. Um, sometimes even the most minute details end up being really fun um, for people in the future. Um, and also people are kind of more inclined to save things, like I mentioned if there's more information on it rather than if there's less information on it. So that's something to keep in mind too. So like I mentioned, we're scanning our photos. So they're, they're being scanned into the file formats of TIFFs and JPEGs. Um, JPEGs are smaller files and I won't get into the minute details of files and their types and things like that because it's kind of boring. Um, but we save them as JPEGs and TIFFs. TIFFs are high resolution images. So hypothetically, if we wanted to, we could take our photos and blow them up to the size of a billboard if we wanted to. I don't know why we would, but you never know. Um, but it's good for resizing. It reduces pixelation. It looks a lot nicer and a lot cleaner than using lower resolution like JPEG. However, our file, our database, past perfect, only saves images as JPEGs. Um, so we have to scan them as TIFFs and then we convert the file into JPEGs. Um, and if there's anyone interested in how we do that, I can talk more about it. But um, So, and JPEGs are also a smaller file size. TIFFs are ginormous. I once had to transfer over 30 posters that were scanned as TIFFs and I think it took like three hours. So something to keep in mind. Um, but if you're at home and you want to scan your images, which is, you know, pretty cool, um, you can save them and share them and all kinds of stuff. A um, couple of things to keep in mind. So have a way to back up the images if your computer breaks. The last thing you want is to scan, you know, 600 of your family's images going back to the 1900s and then your computer breaks and you lose all of it. Um, so things like an external hard drive, or if you can back them up to some sort of cloud service, that's good. Um, as I mentioned, if you are scanning as TIFFs, it'll take up a lot of space. So you might want to keep an eye out for that when it comes to something like Google Drive. I have also heard of um, Google Drive compressing images so that the quality isn't as good. So you might want to look into that as well. Um, you want to use a flatbed scanner of some sort. So you'll see this printer behind me. It has one of those printers that sucks the papers in the top and then spits them out the side. 
you don't want to use one of these um, and we don't use it for scanning our photos because if, for instance, if your image has maybe a tear on one side, it might get stuck and just completely tear it. So you want to avoid that. That would not be good. Um, so you want to use a flatbed scanner. So let me see if I can maybe go on a little adventure here. So this is a, whoop, this is a flatbed scanner. Obviously it's not being used currently, but um, it can scan, you know, a standard size sheet of paper and it scans it to this computer. Um, and I'm not sure how much said scanners cost. This one's been here for a bit. Um, but if you're going to be scanning lots of photos, you might want to invest in one. Um, and they're, they're super handy. Um, you know, you can scan things as PDFs and all kinds of stuff. Um, also when you're scanning files, I kind of mentioned that Alex renames the file names. So they each have their session number so we can type it in look them up really quick and send them on their way. Um, you want to come up with some sort of naming system for your files. So, you know, you wouldn't want necessarily Aunt Jane in black dress. And then maybe the next one is Aunt Jane in black dress too. You might want to have something more concrete. You know, if you're going to organize them by date, maybe organize it by date. There are ways to do tags and things like that when it comes to scanning photos. We haven't really investigated using that just because we have our accessioning number system already, but that's something to consider too, is how you're going to name the files so they can be easily accessible. And you can always, you know, you can try to take up some sort of accessioning numbering system as well um, if you're interested in what we do. So let's see. So we have kind of a three number system. So the first numbering is a year. So like the one I'm looking at right now, um, which let me put these back on and I will, I will talk about these, um, <laughs> keep putting it off. Um, so like this one, which was the one that has the dog goat looking critter in it. Ta -da. Yeah, I really, maybe that is a dog just really weird looking. Okay, but then on the back, see here. So this is the year that it was donated and it looks like it's backwards. So this is the year it was donated, 2005. This was the number of donation that year. So this was the 63rd donation of the year. And this is the number of the item in the collection that was donated as part of this session. So this was the 682nd item. Whew, that's a lot of items that was donated. <clears throat> um, so that's how we do ours. I mean, I don't really know how you would convert that into a household system, um, but there's that. So in case you were curious how we do that, um, let's see. Oh, yeah. So with handling said photos, you know, you see everyone says museum people wear gloves all the time, 100%. So when it comes to dealing with some items, and this, this is kind of on a case by case basis, you generally want to wear gloves. And that keeps your hand oils from getting on the paper and adding those extra oils and degrading the paper or fingerprints or anything like that. Um, you don't want those to get on the photos, it'll damage them over time. And we're talking like years or if the photo is handled frequently, you know, faster than that. Um, but there are some paper documents that might be so fragile that it's actually not a good idea to wear gloves because you're much more, your dexterity is better if you're not wearing gloves. So if you have something that's really fragile and you're really not sure about it, you can handle it with clean, dry hands. Go wash your hands, dry them off really nice, and then carefully handle it. Um, we generally try to wear gloves as much as possible though. There are some photographic compounds too that have historically been used that can be kind of questionable. So it's also not just to protect the photograph from you, but to protect you from the photograph. So that's something to consider as well. Um, it probably won't come up for household photography kind of stuff, but um, there's these things called nitri uh, nitrite negatives. Um, and if you have anything that sounds like that, um, you might want to 
find a way to dispose of them. They have a tendency to self-combust. We don't have any here. Um, I'm not sure that we ever had any. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Although I don't think generally individuals have that kind of thing. Usually those end up at museums um, and then have to be deal dealt with. If you have things like glass plate negatives, um, old timey photo, old timey cameras, the ones that are a lot of times really boxy and they have that kind of accordion shaped lens that comes out the side. Um, those ones used glass plate negatives. So it was an actual glass plate that had chemical, certain types of chemicals on it. And then when you took the cap off of the lens on the front of the camera, the light coming in would affect those chemicals in a very certain way and um, would produce the photo, it would produce the negative. And then you'd have to take it home and process it and um, all that. So some people do have glass plate negatives. We have some here at the museum. Um, I think generally they're pretty safe. You do wanna carefully store them, you know, keep them away from different acids and things like that. Um, there are also tin plate negatives, which I think are older than glass plate, uh, which we actually have a reproduction of one. This was a photo that was scanned for an exhibit and then um, we reprinted it at Costco <laughs> um, for an exhibit that we did on Victorian photography done by one of our volunteers. Um, this one's got two kids and one of them is sitting in a cart that's being pulled by a goat. Um, Let's see, so does anyone have any questions? We have one, one comment that says, do not handle photos while eating buffalo wings. That is some solid advice. Um, I also recommend if you're working with photos or other you know, important items um, to work at a clean surface, keep any food or liquids on another surface or sitting on the ground, um, just so if something were to happen, um, hopefully it wouldn't end up on your workspace because that's the last thing you want is um, uh, coffee on your antique photos. Um, man, I think it's like allergy season. My nose is all runny. Um, so let's see. So our, our photo preservation project um, has been going on actually for a pretty long time. Initially, when we started scanning photos, um, it started with, um, we would scan them as JPEGs and then just put them into Past Perfect. But in 2018, we started scanning them as TIFFs as well to be able to reproduce them for different things. So if you've seen advertising from the last two years or so for the museum and it has old timey looking photos, those are all photos from our collection. Um, I like to include them in as much stuff as I can um, just to get them out there. Some of them are really funny. Um, one that we recently found that hasn't been scanned yet, but I want to scan at some point, but I currently can't because we don't have a big enough scanner is one that's of um, the Canadian tug of war team that came to Eureka at the turn of the century. I have no idea why <laughs> tug of war was popular at that time. Um, but we have a photo and it's a huge one. It's a very large photograph of this group of eight burly men standing there like this with their big mustaches and being like, I'm a tug of war man, you know, and I don't know where it came from. Um, but it's probably one of my favorite photos that I've found. Um, but of course I haven't seen all the photos, so I'm sure there's plenty more in there that are exciting. So Brent says a free program that I use daily is called paint.net or paint.net. Um, so that might be worth checking out. If you wanna tell us a little bit more about that, Brent, you can go ahead and type that in the comments. Um, let's see. So, and in the past we have uploaded some of our photographs, I believe to Pinterest. So sometimes you can see them on, um, on Pinterest. Uh, they also appear on Instagram, Facebook. Sometimes they end up in the Humboldt County History Group. If you're familiar with that, it's a very exciting little group to participate in. Lots of good discussion, lots of um, 
fun stories getting shared in that website, the Facebook group. Um, so let's see, am I missing anything? Hmm. Oh, if you want kind of an idea of how many boxes we have here at the museum that are getting scanned, here's kind of an idea. So these, these some of these are shelves. Uh, well, okay, so these are all boxes of photos. This is kind of the status of some of them, if they've been scanned, if they've been JPEG scanned. Um, and it goes on, it's uh, three pages. Um, and this also does include our documents, which we haven't started scanning yet. Um, and there are dozens of document boxes. So this is gonna be a long time project um, that we're going to be working on. So if and when, or not when, but not if actually, when we reopen, <laughs> sorry, it's getting a little late in the afternoon. Uh, when we reopen, if this is something you're interested in helping with, we do have volunteer scanners that help, or volunteers who scan photos coming in to um, scan photos and contribute to this project. Um, I find it's a lot of fun to scan photos because um, you get to look through everything and see some of the little details that other people might miss. Um, and it is a lot of fun. You get to hang out you know, with the collections and look at things. So and it looks like Brent says, okay, so paint.net um, has some nice features for simple photo correction. It's kind of like a much easier Photoshop type program. So you don't need to be a real wizard to do basic things like cropping and resizing contrast, color correction, some image processing tools. Oh, that's good to know. I'll have to, I'll have to save that. Um, it's, we don't frequently alter our images. Um, it's just something we haven't really done, but that's good to know because there are some images that you can tell are really exciting. Um, but when they were taken, just the technology wasn't really all there. So they didn't turn out very well. Um, I'll keep that in mind. <clears throat> um, let's see. And something else that um, has kind of is on the line of things to be tackled is we have a lot of um, panorama photographs. Those were super duper popular um, early on in the 1900s. Um, and kind of in the 1910s and 1920s, I think is where probably a lot of ours are from. But they're just these ridiculously long photographs, they're framed, um, and sometimes they're just pictures of redwoods. We do have one that is of the Dairyman's Picnic um, that was on display during our industries exhibit, um, which shows, you know, families having a picnic, having a good time. Um, and uh, like those need to get scanned at some point and trying to figure out how to scan that is going to be an interesting feat. Um, Brent says, sometimes you can just adjust contrast and suddenly discover that a photo actually has more visible information and you can sort of expose something that might've been hidden. Yeah, so that reminds me, thank you for bringing that up, Brent. Um, that reminds me, there was a photo that I found while working on um, the Fraternal Order exhibit back in 2017, 2018. Um, and it was a photograph that I noted as a Fraternal Order photograph because there were people wearing these big collar things with these fringes and these ribbons and stuff like that. And I'd seen a bunch of other Fraternal Orders wearing very similar kind of costumes or not costumes, uniforms. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, that's probably Fraternal Order. And I was looked it up and our database said Fraternal Order. And I was like, okay. And, but there were women in the photo along with children, which was weird because usually Fraternal Orders, Fraternal men. Um, so I was not as high tech as Brent, but I took a 
magnifying glass with the light on it and took a closer look at it. And it turned out it was a temperance organization. So it was men and women who were supporting the um, uh, abolition of alcohol or just kind of keep stopping people from drinking because of the uh, social issues it caused. Um, so yeah, taking a closer look at photos in that regard can help get you more information. And if, you know, for instance, one of your relatives says, hey, I got this box of photos and I'm not gonna use them. And um, you should go through them and do something with them. Um, that might be something to consider as well. When If you do scan them, taking a closer look at each photo and seeing if there's little hidden details. Um, and, um, you know, either using a magnifying glass with a light or by actually scanning and processing the images. And that could be cool to note too as well when you're kind of doing your very good record keeping on processing your photos is noting things like that. And sometimes people include maybe a sheet of paper um, in their box of photos um, to note, you know, oh, check out this photo. Like if you were to number the backs of your photos, you could say, check out photo number 10. It's got this thing in it. Look, there's great grandma's dress or something like that. Um, and that can be a lot of fun too. I, I know in the museum, there's been times where we found photos of people and then we've been able to find items that belong to them um, and try to match up if what they're wearing in the photo is maybe the same suit jacket that was donated to the museum. And that's, that's always, that kind of gives me goosebumps when we're able to match things up like that. So look, here's the photo, here's the jacket. Um, it's, I mean, it's really exciting. <laughs> I have a good time with that kind of stuff. Um, we also had a box of photos that were Swedish immigrants. Um, they've been up on display as part of uh, this kind of main hall exhibit. Um, and when Kurt, one of our photo scanning volunteers, uh, came in to set that up, um, he was looking through the photos and, you know, we print, we, he scanned all of them and then we were able to reprint the ones we wanted to hang up um, and put them in frames. And when he was arranging them, he was like, hey, come look at this one. So we go look at it. And there's these two photos. One of them is an individual portrait of a young man. And the other one is a group portrait of, I think there was like six people. And neither of the images said really who the people were or what they were doing or why they were in a group photo. And you know, the group photo, they didn't all, they didn't look related, but you know, who knows. Um, but then when you took the two photos and put them next to each other, you noticed that the portrait was the same guy that's in the group photo, just a little bit older. Um, still has the same hairdo, <laughs> which was part of, how I recognized it. So I said, oh, look, there's his hair, same hair. Um, and so that's always pretty exciting. I don't know who the young man was. We weren't able to figure it out, um, but that's kind of fun to do that. And then particularly with older photos, when people are doing photo studio type things, you can sometimes identify the studio by looking at the background. Um, some people hand painted their backgrounds. Let me see if I can find, I don't know if any of these are gonna be that cause they're all buildings. Um, oh, this is a fun one. Huh. This is very cool. Okay, so let's take a look at this one because this is fun. Um, kind of in the same realm as, um, what was I gonna say? Um, looking closely at the image to learn more about what was going on. So this looks like, okay, well, unfortunately the back of the photo doesn't really say, um, but I can look it up really quick. Actually, yeah, let's do that. So I'm gonna do a share screen really quick. We're gonna take a look and see what we got about this photo. And it does happen with frequency in occasion that someone might donate something to us. They might not have a lot of information. So we're just like, it's a building. Um, oops. Oh, come on. Okay. Oop. Okay. Hang on a second. Let me try this again. Okay. Um, and so it does happen that sometimes photos will get donated and we just have no idea who it is. Hence that this box is a, um, 
a group of photos that say unidentified buildings. Um, okay. Okay. So, okay. So it looks like the just, oops, but you guys can't see this. Let me show you this really quick. Not that our database is super exciting, but you know, might as well get a little glimpse since, since we're here. So this one, it just kind of gives you a description. Large hotel desk in a room with plain wooden floor, half wood, half wallpaper walls. Young man behind desk, older in front, clock, telephone, various posters, map of California 1904, calendar on the wall behind the desk, back wood in lane house. This might be a reproduction. Yeah, this is the reproduction photo. So it doesn't have this on the reproduction photo. Um, William Wid O'Connor as a young man became a Fortuna dentist. And then sometimes it says, you know, stuff like this. So you can take a look at that. Oh, Imperial Hotel, Lane House in Fortuna. Huh, so it's kind of fun. But anyway, so taking a closer look at this photo, let me get back to our little camera here so you can take a look at this. So let's take a close look at this photo. Um, and it's kind of hard to see because this quality, of this camera is not very high quality and this photo has not been scanned yet, but I'm gonna kind of note a couple things. So you can tell on this photo, you can take a look at what the people are wearing and you might be able to get a little bit of an idea of when this photo was taken, you know, besides the fact that we actually have information on when this photo was taken, but you can also see right there, that's a picture of Teddy Roosevelt. Let me take a look at this other one. Other one. Uh, the other one just looks like a horse in a stable. But you can also see, um, <laughs> Besides the spittoons on the ground, got some spittoons down here. Oh, okay, this is this is difficult. Spittoons. I should have picked a picture that <laughs> has already been scanned, but here I am. Um, you can see right here. That's a light bulb. Light bulb hanging down. So, in this old phone over here. So it is a lot of fun taking a closer look at the images that you have available. Um, either, you know, the manual way of just looking at them with, you know, paying close attention or through scanning and then zooming in. So anyway, I feel like now I'm just kind of rambling. Let me see if there's any questions or <coughs> comments. Um, so Kinetic Museum, oh, hey guys, hey neighbors. Pairing photos with items, that's the dream. It really is. It does not happen very often, but I get so excited when it does. Um, my mom says, such a geek. Thanks, mom. Um, <laughs> also, I wonder if you put some of the pictures online or print them and take them out to the Friday night market. People might be able to help identify some people or buildings once you can have Friday night markets. That's true. Um, and that does happen too when we have um, our photographs um, online or in exhibits, sometimes um, our database might be wrong and I might draw from that to note, uh, you know, this photo is taken of this place. And then someone comes in and says, no, that is this other place. And then we'll kind of talk a little bit about it and try to figure out if that is the fact. Um, because it, you know, it does happen. We're not all 100% accurate 100% of the time. So, um, yeah, and I have also taken photos that we've had in the collection and I've tried to use for different things. I'll post them in either our Facebook page, the Clark Museum page, or our Humboldt County History Group, which isn't run by me. It's run by a guy named Nick. He's very nice. Um, I've never met him in person, but I've met him virtually and he is nice. <laughs> um, and I've posted pictures there and said, do you know where this is? And then people say, oh, yes, this is the photos of this one street in this one part of town. And I'm always astounded by this, the things that people know. So um, if you want to learn from other people who have local photos, I definitely recommend that as a place to go. Um, ooh, ooh, sorry. It's been a busy week. I'm very tired. Um, now the phone is ringing. Ah. 
Um, so anyway, oh, it's actually three. Holy cow, time flies. Um, so anyway, I'm going to log off for now. I hope you guys learned something new um, and you had a good time. We will see you next week for next week's Ask the Curator. In the meantime, have a good week. We'll see you all tomorrow. Next week, sorry. Next week.